Hi, welcome to the Wild Learners channel. This is episode 15 and today I am joined with Ricardo Sierra and I'm super excited to speak with him and have you listen to the conversations we're having. Um, Ricardo Sierra is um, the director of Hawk Wilderness, um, Hawk Circle Wilderness Education. He also has an amazing podcast that I've been purging and binging constantly and that is the forest educator podcast you can pretty much find it anywhere it's on apple audible google amazon and also pandora and spotify he is also the director of the forest educator program and they offer trainings both online and in person to people who are interested in getting some teacher training for outdoor education or just collaboration and how to get their program better in different areas so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Ricardo. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm really happy to be here. It's a pleasure. So we were having some really good conversations before we hit the record button on how forest education has kind of been catching on. And we're kind of seeing this need now in like maybe upper elementary age groups of having like still a play-based model, but still having some like teacher-led facilitation and like maybe formal education content. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because we can tackle this com this question in so many different ways, right? There's a, there's uh, you know outdoor or nature-based education is really um, it's so open to you know where you want to you know jump in so like for example in in sweden and the scandinavian countries that you know use this these principles and which for which a lot of forest schooling is based on mm -hmm. that you know kind of then bled into say the um you know the uk ireland scotland england creating this really awesome model and and then they had to do certain things to make that acceptable to you know the department of, Ed of education over there mm -hmm. and so they have a pretty strict guideline so like you're you're not really allowed to just do whatever you want over there but here in america you know in the us and canada um i don't know about canada so much but i do know in the us there isn't a governing body that is like enforcing that if you say want to run a forest school it has to look this way and you can't call it forest school like people are calling it's like the wild west anybody can do right. anything at this point so that's kind of what i'm seeing is that it's interesting but most of the people that are running forest schools in the u.s are trying to get training that is the equivalent of the work in in uh you know these other countries where it's been more established for a longer period of time so mm -hmm. so they're they're kind of bringing that over and then we're kind of in a situation where you know forest school has this really good model for preschool for kindergarten and you know so it's like three hours of being outside four hours being outside all the time and and then what I've kind of been seeing through interviewing people like yourself on my podcast, I've been hearing a lot about how uh, educators are finding that the parents of these children, when they graduate out of kindergarten and go into public school, they're not having good experiences, which, you know, mm -hmm. surprise, surprise. Right. So because of that, they're, they're then turning around and going, hey, can you please, you know, start a first day a first grade or a second grade or third grade homeschooling group that can do this kind of work and we could create a homeschool co-op or whatever so they find different ways to make it happen mm -hmm. and then at that point it's kind of like uh oh because you know it, it's one thing to do this incredible work with preschoolers letting them have a lot of free play where they're just exploring and going wherever their interests are and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, here's some third graders and they want to learn, you know, and they are needing real, you know, integrative, both forest time and learning, you know, whatever, science, reading, history, math, whatever, that those things all still need to get covered a little bit in there. And, and it's tough because all, you know, that's a whole different animal than say watching you know, eight, 
eight uh, preschoolers <laughs> staring right. at there for like an hour. You know, you're like, okay, uh, it's totally different. Right. So yeah, so I'm just I find that that's what I, I think a lot of people that are taking my online trainings and in person trainings are primarily a lot of times coming in going like we need more more activities, we need more crafts, we need stuff to do with them because they are not going to want to just keep doing the exact same thing, you know, on our 10 acres or three acres like they want mm -hmm. to be more dynamic. So that's kind of what I see is is interesting in the United States anyway of how that's sort of unfolding. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I was sharing like in my area and just even from my background as a public school teacher, I I knew that what was happening in public schools wasn't ideal. Like this the situation and the way we were presenting content wasn't the best way to do it. But I also then left the public school and went to, you know, a higher education setting where we had a complete play-based, complete student-directed um, for a school, which was great. It was amazing for the pre-K and kindergarten. But as I was sharing with you, I, I have a huge uh, desire to see kids, especially here in my state of Indiana, uh, perform a lot better in literacy. Because I think literacy is a lifelong skill that you right. need to be a successful human being. So like, how do you take these play-based theories then um, that we know are really good that are going to make learning more fun and engaging, but have that formal content as well. And so um, that's kind of where I was coming in at it. And I think in, at least in my area, it's still kind of new. We, we kind of have like the two parties, like you have the true forest school, which has, you know, it's completely student driven. Um, it's completely outdoors, you know, right. it, you have that part of it. So I feel like what I'm doing here in my area is still very new where um, I also have the formal instruction. We do have like um, progress reports that I'm sending home where I'm tracking growth and stuff in certain areas. And it's, um, I don't know, I guess I kind of see it as like a bridge between the two worlds. And I'm hoping yeah. that I'm hoping that it catches on because I think this is a, a really great model for people who have that ability to have a choice in like schooling um for their kids having this kind of option that maybe can't homeschool um themselves so sure sure yeah we're, i mean I, I i was just writing about this earlier and it's i really believe that uh forest schooling and outdoor you know nature-based programming and educational models I believe that this is the new model that's emerging that can actually address a lot of the problems that current public schools are having, right? So there's a mm -hmm. lot of problems with uh, students who aren't engaged, you know, so they're not, they're not engaged. So therefore they're going to just get bored and start acting out or whatever. Then you have students that are emotionally dis, you know, or socially uh, unregulated. And so they're they're struggling to kind of handle anxiety, depression, uh, various outbursts or whatever, and and feeling that. And and then on top of that, just the fact that like a lot of these programming, you know, that we have in our schools, like sometimes it's just there's just a lot of announcements and a lot of like random stuff that's going on that you know make it difficult. And then also teaching to the test or whatever. So my feeling is, is that there's an, this is emerging. It's a new thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's new in like a lot of different ways. It's, it's not homogenous. It's, it's, you know, 20 different new models are, are popping up all the time in various small, you know, ways itself. So I'm kind of thinking like that, you know, that this is something that is really powerful. We're not getting paid to do it. We're, we're piloting Every program that we run is a pilot program. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it should be funded by somebody. Somebody should be like, hey, Krista, thank you for doing this work. Here's, here's, you know, here's $80,000 to help you do this work and hire someone to document what you're doing and take videos and get the data so that we can see what your model is and then see if that's something we could develop from, something from. And we're not, of course, not doing that. It's all like we're com it's coming out of our pocket somehow. We're having to self-fund most of it. But well, 
Yeah, and don't you feel like... Tough. So for me, I think a hurdle I've been coming across, which has been kind of interesting, um, because Indiana is supposed to be one of the least restrictive states when it comes to homeschooling. Right. Um, but there's still, like, a lot of red tape. And so, like, I don't qualify as a private school, which is fine. I don't really want that. Um, but... But the homeschool laws almost kind of overlap with our daycare laws here in Indiana, which can make like having like a number of children when you're not in a like when it's a home based program versus like, um, you know, a brick and mortar business, it can be kind of complicated. And so, like, yeah. I, I've, I've been really surprised by that. And I'm really interested in like ways that we could convince policymakers and um legislators to 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 see the value of what we're doing and to remove some of that red tape because i think that that has to happen first before we can even address the funding issues right yeah there, it's very very layered you know it's nuanced it's layered it's complicated and the worry that i have this is the one worry that i have is that there's a lot of people who are you know doing a great job they're running their forest school everything's going really well and then a local a local public school will say, wow, you're not having any of the problems that we're having. Would you come in on a Friday and do a Forest Friday or a Wild Wednesday or something like that? And we'll pay you and you could come in and like help create this, you know, help us in our program. And so they're doing it because, you know, like most forest school people, <laughs> if you drag $40, on a string, you know, through the <laughs> woods, you're going to find oh, 10 yeah. forest school educators grab it onto the line. Um, right. There, and, and sincerely, they want to help. Like, they would love to right. be able to go, hey, what, what a great thing to do this. But there's always things that get lost in translation a little bit where you go, all right, you know, can you really do that model just one day? And is everyone going to buy in on it? And what if it's cold? What if it's raining? How do you like there are logistical issues? Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have like just getting the buy in from everyone. And and then how do you set up your contract? How do you get compensated? And so, you know, like I see in forest, uh, forest educator groups, you know, there's a ton of them. I, I belong, I don't know, probably like 12 on Facebook. And, you know, it's every few days there's someone that's like, oh, I've been working in the public system, trying to do it. It's really driving me crazy. And the, they're they're putting me as an aide to another classroom because they had somebody call out sick and I'm right. still doing this nature thing or or they're looking at it and going like, hey, I'm I'm here to deliver this awesome program and I'm getting paid a quarter of what the teachers are making. So they don't have any respect for me. And. I don't even have a contract that's like for a three-year program or something. So they're making mistakes going in, thinking it was going to be one thing, and then it's not, and it's harder. And and then they're kind of like, oh, I'm just giving up. I don't even want to deal with it. It's This is a horrible experience. So I've been kind of like looking at this and saying like, how do we create something that does address this in a traditional way? How do we create sort of like a model that, you know, says, hey, if you're a school and you want to do more of this, maybe just start with like creating three really nice outdoor classrooms and get somebody to come in and train teachers to do the outdoor classrooms. Like maybe mm -hmm. you don't need to jump full for a school right away. And and then on top of that to go, all right, well, what should a school expect to pay, right? Like, I mean, these schools will spend a million dollars on computers for everyone and tablets. But then, you know, like someone like you will be like, Hey, I'll come in and do your outdoor classroom. And they're like, okay, yeah, you're going to roll like three Oak log stumps around and make a mud kitchen out of a pallet. And then you're like, okay, I want to get a hundred grand for that. And they're like, no. Um, but the reality is that's not really what you're doing. You're actually having to train people and just reinforce this model and try to break a lot of the habit. I mean, it's not easy to do the work and, and, and it's just a completely different animal than doing a forest school model where you're like, Oh, the parents are happy. The kids are happy. Yeah. We have problems, but we don't have public school problems in the way that, that I've, right. I mean, I, I've been on TikTok and I listen to what teachers are talking about what it's like in a classroom every day. 
real stories from real teachers. And I'm just going like, holy cow. I didn't realize it, but they said that most, I think it's like 50% of teachers don't make it to their fifth year right now. Yeah. That's I've seriously thought about doing a whole episode on why I left public education. Cause it, I think that unless you're in it, yeah. you don't, you don't see it. And I think that's also why like us as, um, outdoor based or or forest school or whatever term you want to like right. you know label yourself right i think that's why we are having trouble getting the the professionalism we deserve is because like public school educators are not getting the professionalism they deserve oh, right yeah it's across the board right mm -hmm. they're not getting they're not educators are not getting parent support in fact they're getting like blowback from that being called racist and being called Oh, we're abusing them or whatever, whatever, because we didn't give them an A, whatever mm -hmm. it is. The administration isn't backing them up. We're not getting paid. Like, I mean, I'm not a public school teacher. I'm just saying we collectively, but right. but the pay is, is, is bad and they're not willing to increase that pay. And, and then on top of it, you know, you're getting just the, the answer that Albany or, you know, any state capital seems to have is. Well, we better standardize things. We better, we better have more checks and balances. We better have like, you know, so a bunch of suits who don't really necessarily know what it's like to sit in front of today's kids who have anxiety and all that stuff are coming up with these rules that are just like, you're, they're tying people's hands behind their backs. And I, and I think like, it's no wonder I'm surprised it's not higher than 50%. You know 50 percent of teachers leaving at five years so well and i think that's also why we're seeing a mass exodus of students right. i think that's why we're seeing this movement finally growing in the u.s right because i think it's had a foothold for a couple decades um but we're really like even when i started mine like five years ago it was still very kind of this nuanced thing yeah um, i only knew of a handful of other people doing it across the nation and now like like you said there's these Facebook groups, I'm seeing people like, you know, wanting to join and, and finding out more about it and doing these conferences. And I think that's why we're seeing this mass exodus is because like, you're right. Like they're like, well, these things aren't working. So we're just going to try even harder to make them work instead of just scrapping them and, and re looking at the system as a whole. I mean, like, okay, these models are working and these are what the parents are going for. So maybe we should support these or adopt these models. But instead what I'm seeing is like the state's almost getting afraid of what we're doing Oh, there's and a lot putting of more red tape and regulations in that, which I understand. I mean, they're losing funding. And I mean, if sure. you're a policy maker, I mean, that's something you you have to look at. And I understand that. But maybe if they would fix their problem, you know, the, I, I have a heart for public school. And from oh, what sure. I was hearing, you say you do, too, because there are families that can't afford out of pocket education. Right. Absolutely. I'm, Absolutely. I would be one of those people if I didn't have my own program. We could not afford out-of-pocket education or even supplemental programs. Right. Um, but those kids still are just as deserving as qual of quality programs um, as kids that are able to have access to these are. Yeah. So, yeah. So 100%. I'm just really interested in like, how can we, like, how do we start convincing, which is, I don't know, for me as a t having been in the system, seems kind of daunting because I felt like, you know, you I graduated from college thinking like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to change the world, I'm going to change all this stuff. And then after being in the system for so long, like it just wears you down and you're like, nope, like no matter what I say. And so, yeah, like how do, how do we, how do we start getting our voices heard at like even the state level, forget the federal level at this point, at the individual state levels, how do we start doing that? Well, I think... I mean, I hate to say this and I'm like, and, and I, again, I have a, I love what public school teachers are trying to do. And I know that there are just really good people in all layers of education. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't want to feel like, I feel like when I start talking like this, I know that it may seem like we're just bashing it. We're, and I know we're not like, because we want it to work, but one of the right. problems is it's kind of like in a relationship, right? You can be in a relationship and you don't really see what's valuable and appreciate people until they're gone right so like and so in a way you have to in a way vote with your feet like if you just say all right i'm out all of a sudden that person is left sitting there going huh okay wow maybe i really wasn't listening 
you know, maybe I didn't help mm-hmm. with the dishes or, I mean, I'm saying it kind of from a guy's perspective, but it's just like right. you, you would understand it in a way that you can't in the middle and you're in the middle of it. You're like, I've got all these excuses and reasons why I can't do this and why I can't do that and why I don't know if you're right and blah, blah, blah. But it's not until the person actually votes with their feet and, and gets out of there that you're left sitting there going, uh oh, yeah, th- I think we messed up here. And yeah. and I think that, you know, like like the public school system in a way has this power because they're like, we have the money and we are gonna give you give you your pay and everything. But they're almost they're losing that because A, it ain't that much money. Right. Number one. Number one, it's not really a living wage. Number two, the other thing the thing that I'm seeing is that people are go- I mean I think I just saw this this morning. Uh, homeschooling, 2019, the number of homeschoolers in the United States was 2.6 million people being homeschooled kids. In 2023, uh, it's it increased 45, almost 50 percent, 45 percent more. It's 300 and I want to say 50. I mean, it's like 356 million people are now homeschooling. I mean, a huge, huge amount of, of mm-hmm. people. That's a significant number and it's going to continue. And I, and I taught, I, I get people who call me or, or write to me and they say, Hey, Ricardo, I'm a math teacher. This woman from Ohio called me and said, I'm a math teacher and I love doing math. And I thought, you know, I can't really do math in the schools. It's driving me crazy. I dropped out of school, quit school. And I started my own outdoor math program and she said i'm freaking out because i have 250 kids that are coming like you know all the time and i'm going to be doing it and i need help to get other activities for us to do because i'm really good at doing the math part outside and we're having a great time but she's like and she's like i've got the money this is like financially working out really well she goes i'm making awesome. twice, i'm making twice what i was making because there's all these homeschool people that are like Hey, we we'd love to have you take our take our kids and do this for an hour, or three hours, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So there there's now money being pulled out. You know, it's they're not. I mean, the schools still have the money, but I don't know. I don't know what what the answer will be. But now there's you know this other these other models, and in a way, I kind of like that. It's like in a relationship, you, you when a person's sitting there on the couch and they're like, uh, you know what? I think I realized how good I had it. Hey, maybe we should talk about this. And I'd really like to actually listen now. And I'd like to make some changes. And I want to, you know, and I'm saying that on both sides, not just men versus women, but like you really have to have these different parties really willing to listen. And right up until now, I don't know if they're really, I mean, some schools and administrators are willing to listen and some aren't. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I don't think that they're going to f- figure it out very easily because they're used to being in charge and being in control. And I mean, I've had that happen for me. I've, I use, I've run a lot of outdoor uh, uh, after school programs. So I'll give you a story that happened. So we, I was in a, I was in a school and we were doing like throwing sticks. We were teaching kids. I brought like a bucket of rocks and a bunch of sticks and we were like scraping the bark off with the with the rocks and using like stone tools which is just like a chunk of rock that has a little edge on it and i was bringing that out and we had scraped all the rocks and sanded or the log the sticks and then we sanded them and then we were going to use them for like target practice for throwing and stuff and i was carrying this bundle of sticks to my second class and they were all like really excited the kids were excited and I saw like a superintendent walk by and he like did a double take and he was like, what, do, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, oh, we're we're doing uh, nature programs, you know, in the after school program. And he was, you know, he, he kind of like talked to me a little bit and he was like, hey, well, I'm just not sure that this is really what we want to be doing. And I was just like, all right, well. I said, <laughs> I just kind of like I, I'm, I don't I, I want to say I'm obnoxious. I don't mean to be. But I just very bluntly said, like, we're the highest rated program in the after school program. Kids actually sign up for this program, you know, and get homework help and ex- after school lunches and all kinds of support because we're there. We're coming. And I said, 
if you got if you don't want us i can go to another school like i don't it's your problem it's your thing I, it's okay mm -hmm. with me if you guys don't think it's okay but i said to him i said what are you worried about and he goes well they have sticks they could hit each other and i'm like do you have a baseball program do you do field hockey do you do tennis do you have a golf program i said kids have stuff all the time you know i haven't heard anybody get clubbed to death for playing baseball in recent memory i'm sure there's somebody somewhere did but or gotten injured i just go like what are you doing like why are you hassling me instead of looking and having more curiosity you're immediately going to fear so anyway that that conversation ended kind of quickly and then i just went went on and i just did my activity and came back and mm -hmm. i saw him later and i just kind of went hey you know you guys let me know let me know if i should come back i said it's it's totally your call you're in charge you're the you're the man right so i just didn't think anything of it and then i found out later that he went and talked to the head of the after school program and the conversation I, I heard from one of the other staff members that they said they were standing there and the superintendent came in and was asking a question and she goes you didn't mess with ricardo sierra did you she's like please whatever you do don't mess with him like he's he's the reason that we're even able to do this if we didn't have this we wouldn't even get enough kids to get the funding to do the after school program yeah. We need the minimum number of kids and we can't get them on our own, you know, and, and the kids love it. They talk about, it. he goes, he only comes eight times a year and they talk about it all year long. They tell the parents about it. The parents are really happy and excited. And she's like, what are you doing? All of this is going to just disappear if he decides to go. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating maybe, but I, maybe she was, I don't know. All I know is that I just heard this story from her and and he and he just completely was like, oh, oh, OK, I didn't know. I didn't know. And she's like, whatever you do, leave him the hell alone. Like, <laughs> yeah, she's like, look, I mean, and, and she was a teacher. She's a teacher at the school running the after school program as well. And afterwards, she was like, I've never seen that teacher talk like that to a superintendent. You know, most of the time we're all afraid we're going to get fired or whatever. And uh, all I know is that she they told me that story. And then the next time I saw him in the hallway, he came over to me and went, hey, I'm really appreciated of what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you so much you're doing. And and I think she also said, like, this is a landmark thing that's putting us on the map. She's like, this is, this is going to make you look good as a superintendent because this is happening under your watch, this innovative new program that everybody loves. And so I, you know, to me, I just look at it and go like, Hey, we're the ones with the forest school knowledge. We're the ones with these techniques. If you don't want us, hey, good luck with all those kids that are like really anxious and they're acting out and like enjoy, like enjoy it as everybody's leaving and you're not getting enough teachers. Good luck. Like I, it's okay with Whoa. us. Do you know what I mean? I mean, not, it's yeah. not really because we don't, those kids are all good kids and they deserve that. But we can't negotiate from a position of weakness where we're like, oh, please, please give us a crumb and right. give us a dollar and then we will help change everything for you. But we have no power and we won't be able to actually change anything because you won't even listen to us. We're like, hey, if you, you're the ones with the problem. If you don't mm -hmm. want to come in and get on board and actually just be quiet and listen and like sit and watch this stuff and figure it out. We've got the data. I mean, Children in Nature Network has like all the data, like all there. So, much. Yeah. so we look at it and just go, you're the ones that are running your school program, acting like we need everything to be data driven. But none of what you're doing in practicality is actually data driven. Like if it was, they've done the data, right? High school kids right. should start school an hour and a half later. According to the data, it would be better for the kids, for the grades for everybody if school started later for them for their that's not a that's not a a good idea that's a fact of right. what they've done with study so they're not doing that uh why not oh it's we uh, we don't know we're it's hard we don't want to change so i look at it and go if you don't want to change you're on your own right i mean there's a bunch of guys right. right now sitting on their couches alone having a beer wishing for football season to be back who are lonely, who just go, I refuse to change. <laughs> right. And then they'll say to their friends, well, I'm kind of lonely. And you go, 
you know, hey, have you thought about getting a dog? Like, because if you're not going to change, who's coming to come back to you? You know what I mean? Like, good luck. You're on well, your own. I'm like listening to you. What I'm also thinking about is like, I think COVID kind of showed parents like what school right. was looking like because parents don't exactly. get to go into the building, right? And yeah. they're like, wait a second, this is not conducive to my child or like our values. And that instead of letting parents have more control or say, it's almost like they're doubling down on like, nope, this is what we're doing. This is how it is. And I think that, you know, educate, like we've always known that education doesn't end at school, right? It's a continuation. And yeah. as a teacher, I'm here to tell you, like, if you have parents that are supportive and, and reinforcing things at home, that child's going to be better for it. But we've almost like tried to make this school and like home life completely separate. Yeah. And schools have like, okay, this is how children have to behave at school. This is what they have to do at school. When you when when they go home, there's like almost a completely different set of values and expectations. Right. And, and parents are sick of that. <laughs> but yeah. I haven't seen a lot of change in the public school system to like try to get parents more involved or to like even welcome parents back into the building. Um, like back when I was a kid, I know that like we had parents coming in and just listening to us read all the time. Now, like there's so much like teachers don't want administrators. I, don't, I won't say teachers because as a teacher, I always wanted extra help. Right. But administrators sure. almost don't want teachers in there or parents in there because they're scared of what they're going to see. To be honest, they're going to see oh, yeah. those disruptive behaviors and off task behaviors because they're they're sitting there for 90 minutes. Not doing, and it's not the fault of the teacher, right? She has 32 exactly. kids she's trying to manage on her own. What she's They're going to see the reality. They're going to see the right. reality that everybody deals with day in and day out. Right. Honestly, that needs a lot of daylight. That's what I love about TikTok is that TikTok people, they're just talking and they're going like, here's what my day was like every day. And, mm -hmm. and they're telling the truth. I mean, these are not people making it up. There's no incentive for them. It's not just sort of like a fun, crazy thing. They're literally like looking tired. Some of them are crying. I mean, it's hard. Well, and so, if you're in education, you know, like I, that's my thing. Like now that I've left that field it and I get on there and I see these videos of these teachers like sharing their struggles. Honestly, the comment section for me is where I go because those teachers are getting validation from other teachers. Like, yes, 100%. I'm seeing this. I'm, I experienced this. And like, it, all you have to do is go check out the comment section to know, like, this isn't a one-off experience. I saw, right? I saw an art teacher and she was just sharing like how hard her day was and everything else. And she like loves her kids and everything, but she was just sharing about how hard it is. And she had something like 7,000 comments. And I would say 99% of them, were uh teachers that were either going like yep i left teaching and i've never looked back everything you're saying is true that's why i quit and then or they're saying this is exactly what my day is like i'm actually getting all choked up and stressed out just listening to your two minute video and then mm -hmm. reading these comments and it was just over and over again there was a couple of them that were like you know well if you guys had subjects that were engaging then maybe blah 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 which I don't know, might be true in some way. In some cases, honestly, there's enough layers of truth in a lot of ways. But I'll just say that, you know, people have no idea. And and even for like nature programs, I mean, I've run summer camps and that emotional dysregulation stuff, like, do you, you know, that is really a big deal. And there's a lot. Mm -hmm. I want to say, I used to say I think 25% of people have mental some elements of mental illness. I think it's higher to like more like 50% that people are struggling with mental illness. And I don't mean like oh they're crazy and put them in a you know right. sanatorium or whatever, but I right. mean they're struggling and and we're not really prepared. Like I don't think anybody, and parents aren't really prepared. Like when parents have an autistic kid, they're just like, okay, he doesn't want to be hugged. He doesn't want to be read to. He doesn't want to, you're like, what do we do? And they're freaking out. And I think that there's levels of parenting that are just like, we don't know what to do with our kid. Right. Oh. Well, and like, I know, yeah. That really, like, yeah, yeah. I, like I said, like before we even started the push the record button, like I've been tempted at times to, like just share my journey and like why I left public education. 
Um, and I have a little bit here and there. I, the biggest reason I have it is because I think there is a lot of that content out there yeah. and it, 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 it can be very disheartening. And, the, and like, I know as, as a teacher in, in the thick of it, not feeling like I had a good option out, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uplifting at all. We'll put it that way. And I can't tell you how sick I got of hearing, well, if you just supplied Henry Wong, have you read Harry Wong? Like, it's like that, <laughs> like yeah. in the real world, like, sure, those, some of those principles are great principles, but they work on kids that are ready to be regulated. When your yes. kids are coming in and not having their basic needs met, those kids aren't ready to be regulated. Schools, like higher education, does not teach you, or even if they did, you're not equipped to meet those physical or even emotional needs when you, you know, are there to teach. You know, I'm yes. not, I'm not a, you know, social security worker that has access to programs if i did like that could solve some things but also could i do that for 32 kids and teach at the same time no way like no not no, at all we're kind of in a we're kind of in a thing where like covid created a lot of trauma created exacerbated problems that we were already having and we're kind of like teachers right now in my opinion they're in a triage situation yes. and in many cases like like we have our children you know all of our children got homeschooled at different times and you know they would just be in school and it would just be one of these things where every day there was like something really dramatic that was happening and so my wife was just like all right this is it i'm tired of you coming home every single night and just getting crazy and she's like that's it you're homeschooling you know, and, and my daughter was like, well, well, what do you know, for how long, you know, and she's like, as long as it takes. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we said, Hey, we're homeschooling. And I think she said, Hey, here's the curriculum we're using, blah, blah, blah. And then she didn't let my, she, she didn't tell my daughter to do anything. Like she just was like, here's the curriculum, do what you want to do. And she, so my daughter was like baking and you know going for walks and taking care of the animals and like helping clean and she like rearranged her room five times like she needed almost like three months just to decompress from what to mm -hmm. find her actual baseline mm -hmm. and in order to then go what do i want to do and you know and so she was like watching movies and watching show i think she was watching the oc remember the oc right? <laughs> in the day. yeah you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the point is, is that it took her a while to find, like, she really loved acting and she really liked creative, you know, being creative. And, and when she was in, in the public school system, it was just drama, other kids with trauma, other kids with parents with drug abuse issues and other, you know, whatever, the opioid things or well, whatever it was. And there's and no outlet for those creative they, kids, right? Those programs right. are being cut. <laughs> and, well, and those programs that she, I mean, she wasn't in a, she was in a program or two, but it just wasn't good. And there was a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of trauma, but nobody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's like taboo to say, hey, how's your mom? Is she, you know, getting better or hey, what happened to your dad? Or like, it's just like, oh, we better just not talk about these things. And when you're 12 years old and that's what your life is and nobody's talking about it, you kind of go crazy. And you know what? I, I don't think it's really that important to learn the Pythagorean theorem at that moment. That's not the priority. And, you know, and when nobody's actually going to address the, the problems, you kind of have to go into triage mode and go, hey, you know what? Let's just let you to get better. Let's just let you have some space from the from the stuff. And I think that's where like a lot of these nature programs come in is that it's it's a long game, right? So like, yeah, if your kid is struggling in the public system, you get them homeschooling and then you put them in a nature program, let them have six months, let them have nine months in that program and let them look at frogs and build a shelter and build forts and sit by a campfire and like just figure it out they're going to catch up to a lot of that down the road. Like when they're ready, they're going to go, they're going to eat information and get inspired, but you can't push that too quickly when they, okay. but when they are, that's when you want to really then encourage the reading and everything else, but then they'll be right. self-motivated. But I, but schools don't really want to hear that. I think they really got to go, Hey, how can we like 
adopt a couple things and then get back to being in charge and telling everyone what to do and you know <laughs> laughing behind right. your closed doors at how low you're getting little money you're getting or whatever and and i think like it, we really need a whole new approach in a way for this and so i mean homeschooling homeschooling is unfortunately for for, for better or worse homeschooling is the only real way that it's going to make major changes i think i i don't think that i don't think it's one of those things where we're just going to talk it out because we've been talking it out for decades and nobody's really it's not penetrating yeah so. well it's oh yeah it's like you said it's almost like talking with like so like if you don't you know if you don't support certain things you don't spend your money there right 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 schools are based on funding and actually something interesting that i was going to add is here in indiana um, there's a new program called the ESA program and it follows students with IEPs. So, you know, our taxes, our tax dollars go to the schools. Yeah. So depending on your district, there's a certain amount of money that's allocated per child. Yep. Well, they're, they've actually created this program now and they're looking to extend it to families beyond just students with IEPs. But these programs that can apply and be, you know, uh, kind of like accredited by this program. They don't actually need accreditation, but like tutoring services and things like that. Um, parents can access that money so that, and use that money for different services. And I think that's great because yeah, like I'm paying taxes right now for my kids to go to a district that I pulled them out of and I will right. never send them back, right? Right, right. But so everything that I'm doing for like our schooling is coming out of pocket on top of my taxes coming out. Yeah. So it's, it's really hard for, you know, certain families because like, you know, we're pretty lucky and that we can make it work out. Like, you know, right, I mean, right. I'm not going to say it's not hard. There's like anybody who homeschools has to give something up, right? Like it's, it's yeah. definitely uh, a balance. But I think that in in that regard, I, I'm really glad to see that people are having access to, to, to their money to have some freedom of choice for education. And I hope that that trend continues. Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think I do think that. Like, it's probably going to be really difficult for parents to, like, pull their kids out and deal with it. But it's also difficult to send your kid to school and then watch them come back with those like dead eyes where they're just like not happy. They're they're like this close to like breaking down and crying and they feel overwhelmed and they're just, there's no spark in them and they just need to like chill out. And then they start going into that with withdrawal behavior. Like you, you know, yeah. Is it hard to homeschool? Heck yeah. Really hard. But at the same time, it's better than watching the life drain out of your kid. Right. And some people can do it. Some people go, hey, you know, I work in construction. I can't homeschool. My kids go into the public school, figure it out. And that's it. And then they just, you know, when kids come back, and you just go, all right, well, hey, let's go do something. You, tr you try your best. But there are some parents that can do that and some can't. And so therefore, um, you know, like what's the good of having an extra whatever, 300 bucks a month, right. if your kid is like going to be, I mean, all that money is going to go into therapy or something, or <laughs> right. you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, right. Well, and I, and I mean, this might be, it seems like it's off topic, but it's really not. And I think it comes down to like, we, I don't know, this, this is probably the millennial in me talking. So we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll see how this goes. But I yeah, feel yeah. like we, we grew up Do in it. this like Do consumerism it. mindset, right? Like, right. We got to have this new car. We got to have this new house. And if, like this, if your standard of living isn't here, then you're a failure, right? Right. So obviously I left my job at the college. I am now like homeschooling and like doing programs that like they cost money. They do. I But for what I'm putting back into the program and into the students that are coming, I'm making very little. But it yep. has been the most rewarding experience for me, one, to see my kids actually thriving and two, to actually let go of these, because like, I can't meet these expectations. Like I'm driving right. a car that is 24 years old and is currently not running, to be honest. It's sitting in the driveway. And before that would have like really stressed me out. And now it's like, you know what? Who cares? 
Like, I yeah. don't care yeah. anymore. And it's been, like, really freeing. And I think that we're seeing a lot more millennials maybe doing this because, like, we're from this generation where NCLB, No Child Left Behind, yeah. got put in a place. And, like, we, we remember, like, we were there. We were traumatized. Like, we were part of the generation where this kind of started. And, like, we were told we had to go to college. So, you know, we struggled through college. We, we struggled through school. And, like, learning wasn't fun. It was something that was required and we had to do. Yeah. And, like, if you look at the number of millennials that don't read in their free time, like, don't read for enjoyment, it is insane. It is it like, is, it is scary because, like, we know as educators that, like, parents that read to their kids, those kids are going to have a love for reading. Well, a lot of millennials aren't reading to their kids because they're just not reading. They're yeah. burnt out. They're exhausted. They're traumatized from the system. Yeah. And I think a lot of millennials are starting to see that and like they don't want that for their kids. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that. Um, I've heard this from teachers where they will say that a lot of times parents will put like a Winnie the Pooh story on their, on their iPad and give that to them and go, right. okay, when the story's done, turn the iPad off and go to sleep. And then they just leave. And, you know, so they're letting Disney put their kid to bed while they're like in the other room street streaming stranger things or something. Right. So, right. um, which, you know, honestly, I can understand that they, Hey, I, I need some me time or whatever, but the kid isn't getting that human contact. And I mean, it's such a different thing to have Winnie the Pooh be read to you mm -hmm. on an iPad versus having a live person being there and being responsive and sharing the emotional experience. Like, like my family, mm -hmm. We don't like it when we're sitting around watching TV and if like three people are like on their phone and we're trying to watch a show, we're kind of like, hey, do we want to watch this show together and or do we want to be like interrupted? Do we want to half watch it? Right. And right. it's like it's a, just not the same experience. And so, um, you know, it's it's just this whole element of like, how do you get back to that? Like what I'm worried about is that I come from a generation further back where I grew up where there was no TV. We lived really rural. You know, we didn't, I remember the first answering machines. Like that was, that's how far back it goes. Right. right. And, and so everything was done outside, sitting out on the porch, doing all that. Like that's my childhood. There was no, there was no other childhood, but now when millennials and now this Gen Z come up, they have never experienced a world. I mean, millennials know what like MySpace is and, you know, a right. AOL Messenger and stuff, but, but they haven't really, you know, Gen Z's never had, you know, no cell phones, smartphones, all right. this stuff. And, and so they don't even, they can't even comprehend a world with that other stuff without mm -hmm. it. So when they raise their kids, they don't have anything to, like, it just it fundamentally doesn't exist for them, right? So they're kind of like going, all right, well, uh, this is what we're doing. And I, I don't even know that there's an alternative to do it, like to go, hey, well, what if we go pick green beans at grandma's farm? They don't have that. They don't know what it's like to just sit on the porch and listen to a thunderstorm come in mm -hmm. because they're inside playing Call of Duty. So it's like, you know, when you, when you lose that information, it's very difficult to get it back. And, yeah. and then, so, so in a lot, a lot of ways, it's not going to be parent driven. The nature model will not be parent driven where they go, I want more nature for the kids. It's not because they don't even know the value of it themselves. The, but the only way that they're going to probably come at it is going, I'm homeschooling my kid and I'm going crazy. Can you help me? And then we'll go, well, I'll teach them math, but it's going to be outside. And they're going to be like, whatever, I don't care. I, I got to go to yoga and get a glass of wine with my with my girls, you know. And they go, okay, hey, so we'll see you in three hours. And then you do your thing. And then, you know, that's just how it is, right? So right. it's weird. I mean, it's, it's so complicated and nuanced, but I think that we're going to find our way through it because the forces are going to, it's going to push it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big the public school system is. They can't, they can't sustain what they're doing when it's contributing to the mental illness of the teachers and the kids and probably the administrators too. 
Mm-hmm. So it's got to change. And somebody, I don't know, somebody needs to say it. I wish that there were more advocates talking like this, like what we're doing at a higher level that other people are listening to. I don't know of anybody who's actually saying it. A lot of it's just like, children need nature, blah, you know, it's, well, we figured it out. We did a $2.3 million study and we found out that going outside is good for kids. And I just go, man, we don't need that. Hey, maybe we could get some people to take like Toastmaster lessons and then go up and do more forceful communication. Maybe we need John Stewart or somebody, like somebody who can really like, be a good communicator and actually i think that's the problem right to get things changed we have to like take people like us that see the value of it but take us out of nature and put us in suits and ties in congress buildings right where we're not comfortable but that is what it's going to take right because we're not going to get there without that advocacy at that level with people making like and i think comedy in a way is a good route because Mm -hmm. you know you look at like comedy that can be this biting satire that can kind of just like both make fun of something and also then point out a problem and also then Mm -hmm. add a little nuance and then say hey this is there are answers here so i mean it's not the answer but it's just like somehow it has to get into the into the conversation right just like kind of like how bernie sanders kind of got the whole um you know, uh, socialized health care, you know, like free health care kind of thing. I mean, he made the mistake of going, oh, free, 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 which is like a red flag for a lot of people. Understandably so. But at the same time, at least it got people talking about it. So now in America, of course, we go, oh, we couldn't do that. That's not going to work. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's it's such a horrible, hard thing to do that only 300 something million, you know, 300, 300 countries have managed to do it, including Mexico and other places. Like, like, yeah, it must be so difficult. Um, But, you know, you need somebody to have that kind of biting satire to respond to that and to say, well, it's too expensive. And you go, it's actually more expensive right now. The system we have right now is more expensive for our whole country and our government and all of us than if we just did it, right? So... Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. you know, where, again, I don't know where the money's going to come from. I don't know what what's going to happen that will break this free. But sadly, the public school system, it's not that they're making, I don't know of anybody that's making that much money on it, right? I just don't know why it's so, there's I mean, enough I can think there of like, really well. I know the state superintendent makes a ton of money because you can find, like, at least for Indiana, because you can see her her salary and it's like wow you're in education and can make that or you know curriculum developers i mean mcgraw hill makes a ton of money it's all yeah all that money all that money can go to textbooks that are or whatever right and it's like you have an instant market i mean i would love to write a book and have the same market right guaranteed sales right Right. no it's true it's really true it is and i think that um Yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting. I think that there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm very passionate about, but at the same time, like, there's these hurdles, and it's like, okay, like, I'll be first to admit it. Like, I know what the next step should probably be and and what needs done. I I don't feel like I'm the person to do it, maybe, necessarily. Maybe I should be. I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I, it's fair. It's a fair thing. I don't feel, I'm the same way. I don't want to be... Uh, the the advocate or the face of the movement or whatever, right? But at the same time, I am going to say that we'll know when it, when the time is right that we need to we do need to advocate for this stuff, even if we don't feel comfortable to at least put out these ideas and just you know because what's going to happen is otherwise you're going to be doing it for like ten years, twenty years, thirty years. And then there's going to be somebody coming along that's going to be like, I'm 12 years old and I'm now the F-Ace. And you're going to be like, damn it. They're making yeah. $2 million a year <laughs> on TikTok selling their curriculum. And I've been grinding away here because nobody knows about me. So we have to find right. a way to um, establish that your 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 expertise in this world. And and I think by doing your this podcast, you know, YouTube show or whatever it is, that wherever you post, host it, it's like, that's a that's at least a way to say hey i'm putting my st- you know putting a stake in the ground and i'm making a saying this is what i want to do and 
And that's, that's a key thing. And I, and I think honestly, like your kids will be homeschooled, but you're going to be able to make up some of that money down the road. Like you're, you're not going to be just because you're in it right now. And like, you know, car, you know, my, I, my truck needs new brakes and stuff. It's sitting out there. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> right. But the thing is, the thing is, is that it won't always be like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, because even though it sucks right now for maybe a year or two, five years, but in eight years from now, there's a good chance that it's going to break free and you're going to suddenly be like, hey, I have more free time. I'm going to go take, you know, work part time again or whatever. And you have a chance to kind of make up a little bit. So, well, uh, and I think what also it took me, I'm not going to say that. I mean, it took me a very long time to get here and it, I still struggle with it, but at the end of the day, like, I feel like my moral compass is where it should be. Like, right. I'm, I feel like, you know, like maybe certain areas of my life are a hot mess because of finances, but at the same time, like the things that matter, like my family is more aligned than we've ever been. Right. right. I feel like community wise, like I've built a stronger relationship with my community than I could have ever had as a public school teacher. Um, and I've been able to do advocacy work even locally that would have been done if I hadn't done this. Right. And yeah. I think that some of those non-monetary things are more life enriching than money yeah. could ever be. Now, money is obviously so important because we do live in a consumer is driven world, right? We live in a capitalist society. So money is a necessity, but I think that uh, as we see more people doing this, so like, as we were talking about, like, 50% increase in homeschooling. I think that like, that's going to have a trickle down effect into the economy too, because like as more and more, you know, husbands or wives, whichever are staying home to homeschool, there's less, you know, income for that household, which means that I think that's going to end up having to drive some prices down because people aren't going to go out and spend $120,000 on a new suburban. Right. 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 It's not going to happen. That's right. not going to be the normal. You can't, afford to, you can't afford to go out to dinner. You, right. can't, you can't go out to dinner three times a week because it's just way too expensive. Mm -hmm. So just it's, yeah, there's a, there is an effect. It is an impact a hundred percent. No, yeah. it's, it's really nuanced. And, uh, and I think that there's some really good models with it. My, I guess my advice would be if you're a teacher and you want to incorporate more nature, look into those outdoor classroom models, because that's something you could probably do without having to like take your group on endless field trips. You could just get outside, even if you're in like a playground or whatever, right next to school, you mm -hmm. can still do some stuff. Number one. And number two, if you do decide you're going to not drop out of school, you know, of the public school system and actually, you know, jump into like nature education, just do whatever you do, whatever you're good at and just do it outside. Like, so I'm doing a program coming up in, um, in April, the end of April, and it's a mythology, uh, poetry and nature program for teachers. I saw that. And it's a, it's basically we, we, we take like, um, parts of the story of the Iliad, the Greek myths, mm -hmm. and we, we reenact some of them out in, a, in the forest. You know, we go into a dark forest where the monsters are, you know, the minotaur or whatever. We go to someplace up on the mountain. We go, like we go to different parts and then it reenacts certain things and then, give them time in nature, have them make their own swords and spears and stuff. And then what happens is that they're, they are then energized by creative writing and poetry and that process. And it's a little bit like theater as well, but like that's, but that's a marriage of nature and that creative writing. Uh -huh. The kids, the kids that go through the program, the, the guy that's coming out from England, uh, Johnny Walker, like he's doing this and these kids are like then writing, they're going back and writing. They get a little booklet of all the poets and poems and things they write. And then he writes up a, you know, all, takes all their poems and puts it in like a really nice, you know, like Shutterfly kind of like oh, photo yeah. album or whatever. So they get that and then when they get home. But they're, those kids will go on a, a year later, two years later, they're submitting their poetry, you know, nationally and winning awards because we're training the next Homer, right? The next right. Uh, saga that, you know, the next George Lucas, who's going to create the next 
incredible movie or J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. They're they're living right now and they just need somebody to do it. And we can do that. So just take what you do and then, you know, hit those homeschoolers hard and just going, hey, get really good at what you're doing outside and then yeah. do it. That That's kind of my advice in some ways. Um, I agree. We're running out of time, but I just wanted to add because I did see that on Facebook. I think it's a great program because we were talking about, you know, just the mental toll that these kids are having, the connection yeah. to technology and the lack of relations. I love that you're doing that because I feel like literacy really is the answer to a lot of these problems because literacy is the original storytelling and storytelling yeah. in and of its nature is so relational, right? Yeah. So if we can start building that literacy, those literacy skills back up so that we, like you said, have the next Steven Spielberg or have the next, you know, Chaucer yep. that is giving yep. these great stories that are bringing people together. I think that we can like start healing t as a society and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see a huge benefit from that. That's so, right. And we have a, and we have a youth program that he's doing too. He's actually got a four day youth version so he's, we're doing the youth version and a teacher's version. So, cause we wanted to, when he came out, we're like, Hey, we should get homeschoolers who want to experience this because he's from the UK. So he's like, Hey, I'll bring my, you know, all my cool stuff to do this. And so we're doing it. It's in upstate New York. It's in April. You could go to my website, you could find it. And if you're a teacher and you want to learn how to do it, come on out and figure it out. Just, you know, to me, this is awesome. And, and so just keep, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I could keep going in a long ways, but man, this is really great. I really love the yeah. fact that we're having good conversations like this. So I was like, this is a great conversation. I hate to end it, but like, I usually try to keep these to about an hour and we're already over. So just so everybody knows I'm going to link all of Ricardo's podcasts, programs, everything down in the video subscription. And I really highly encourage you to go check him out. And, uh, Anything else you want yeah. to add before we end the video? Hey, I'm really excited. I'm I'm actually hopeful because the fact that we're seeing these numbers increasing to that degree, it's actually really hopeful because we're seeing action and ultimately mm -hmm. that will eventually create change. So, and we have we have to change. We have our culture has to change anyway. So, yeah. we just have to embrace it a little bit and keep doing it and and you're leading the way too. So I'm, I'm loving it. Thank you for letting me be on here. No, thank you so much for joining me and giving all of your words of wisdom to my listeners. I appreciate it so much. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.